morning I have the distinct honor and pleasure of um, introducing our commencement speaker who will also be receiving an honorary degree from the University of Florida today, uh, uh, retired Colonel Matthew Hepburn. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Hepburn and then he's going to launch into a very interesting talk. Um, so Dr. Hepburn is dedicated as a professional career, actually I'm going to lose this if you don't mind, uh, to addressing the threats of infectious disease and in pandemics. Um, he's currently the vaccine development lead for the Countermeasures Acceleration Group, formerly known as Operation Warp Speed, a partnership between the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense. This was founded in May of last year to help accelerate the development of COVID-19 vaccines, which allowed me to take my mask off. Prior to this position, Dr. Hepburn served as the Joint Project Lead of Enabling Biotechnologies for the Joint Program Executive Office for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Defense. In his role, he was responsible for establishing a start-to-finish capability to develop vaccines and therapeutic solutions against current and future biologic threats. Due to the creation of this foundational capability, Dr. Hepburn and the enabling biotech team implemented the Department of Defense Vaccine Acceleration Program, which provides key investments to advanced vaccines and therapeutic antibodies, with special emphasis on acceleration of manufacturing and clinical trials. These investments also provide critical initial actions to enable Operation Warp Speed. He also served 23 years in the United States Army and as an infectious disease physician, retiring as a colonel. His final assignment was program manager at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the research and development agency of the Department of Defense responsible for developing emerging technologies for use by the military, things like GPS. Um, Dr. Hepburn served there for six years and implemented numerous breakthrough investment programs to prepare for the current pandemic. These investments led to improved ID forecasting, better diagnostics and medical care, and resource limited areas, and development of vaccine and therapeutic products. A significant investment in rapid antibody discovery scaling with a pandemic prevention platform aimed at discovery of antibodies and getting products into clinical trials within 60 days. Again, think about that. Um, these investments were applied during the current pandemic, leading to the current therapeutic antibody pro pro uh, portfolio of investment by Operation Warp Speed in the Department of Defense. Concurrent with his time at DARPA, Dr. Hepburn also served on the research and development team at the new Research Development and Acquisitions Directorate. You guys have all these cool men. We, we do. We do. <laughs> so, in my title, do you want to be fun about this? Because we should do it. Embarrass ourselves in the government. So, before Operation Warp Speed, I was the JPL EV for JPO CDRMD. <laughs> what does that mean? Why can't we just communicate? But anyway, please right. continue. Um, uh, he also served as the Director of Medical Preparedness on the White House National Security Staff. In his role, he was responsible for leading interagency policy to address the lessons learned from the H1N1 influenza pandemic. Other accomplishments have included completion of the National Strategy for Biosurveillance, which created the policy framework to support advances in public health surveillance applied in the current pandemic. Um, additional assignments have included Chief Medical Officer of Level 2 Treatment Facility in Iraq, for which he earned a bronze star. Prior to the deployment, Dr. Hepburn was Clinical Research Director at the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Disease, leading domestic and international clinical research efforts on biodefense. This role entailed extensive service with the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program in the republics of the former Soviet Union. Colonel Hepburn also was an exchange officer in the U.K. and internal medicine chief resident at Brook Army Medical Center at Fort Sam Houston in Texas. He completed his IV fellowship and in internal medicine residency at Burkhardt <coughs> Medical Center in San Antonio and received his medical degree and undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering from Duke University. Please welcome Dr. Hepburn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, probably one of the last things you said after all of the acronyms, <laughs> so sorry it took 20 minutes to read all the government titles and things, but um, kind of feels like a 
um, back to my chief resident year in a bit of a you know kind of a morning report type format, and so uh, I have a formal speech uh, ready later. So I want to make this one as informal as possible. So I'm going to be really informal. We'll talk vaccines for an hour. We'll take it where you want to go. Um, uh, this audience, ask questions, please, or I may start calling on you. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, uh, start briefly with intense, intense gratitude. Uh, certainly to Dr. Cooper, to the, the hospitality who came in last night, had a great dinner. Um, it, it is, frankly, overwhelming hospitality uh, that the University of Toledo Medical Center has shown me and uh, my lovely wife Janice has accompanied me here, so, uh, uh, but we've been welcomed. Um, and that's kind of a very much. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Ellis, because Dr. Ellis was the person who nominated you and did many of the arrangements for last night, so please no credit to me, yeah. Dr. Ellis. The, I, so I trained my ID fellowship with Dr. Ellis, and I appreciate the acknowledgement. I was going to embarrass him, so um, <laughs> we'll, we'll prefer, I think you all know Michael well, but um, you know Michael is, uh, has been a dear friend uh, for many, many years. And you all know these people who um, you, you train with, you know very well, and then you carry on that friendship over many years and many times, you know, and, and those people are really special to you. And Michael's really uh, that person to, to Janice and myself. So it, it's great to see him, and I think you're very lucky to have him part of your um, university family. Um, so, so my intent today, uh, they asked me to give a little bit more background on Warp Speed. What I was going to do is mostly Kind of pivot sort of the what's happened, what I think is going to happen next in some of the major categories in terms of a little bit less about where we've been um, and a little bit more about where we're going. If I can get the first slide. So I'm, I'm, I wanted to be more future rather than past. Uh, last night they asked me to talk a little bit about the past. So for, for those in the room, maybe others um, kind of on the WebEx. Um, so it, it, it was a truly extraordinary experience kind of over the last year for me with um, being in the Department of Defense. As the introduction to admittedly, my, my role there was pandemic preparedness and, and rapidly accelerating vaccines and, and therapeutics in case we had a pandemic. And so what that meant was going all the way through kind of the early discovery and preclinical, making sure we could discover antibodies and vaccines uh, really quickly. Um, getting into manufacturing and early clinical trials and trying to do that in an enormously short period of time. One of my programs at DARPA was sort of a 60 days from antibody discovery to at least phase one clinical trials. Um, I think what one of the things we've seen with this pandemic is, is that that's possible. It, it just is because Moderna and Pfizer did that and the other vaccine companies weren't too far behind. And where I was, I was a little bit more shading on the antibody side of things, but we saw multiple monoclonal antibodies that are now in practice. And that pace should be five years, that pace should be seven years, that pace should be a decade. Um, you know, they were, uh, I think the, the Lilly antibody had achieved emergency use authorization within about seven or eight months from when they started their discovery program. So, so these are, these are record-breaking times, and I had a chance to work on that a little bit in the Department of Defense um, before Operation Warp Speed. Operation Warp Speed uh, uh, was announced at a Rose Garden ceremony May 15th, actually, so it's, we're, we're almost exactly at a year. And um, the, the fortunate part for me is, is that there was insight to say, this has to be all hands on deck. This is... This is a catastrophic once in a century pandemic. We can't, we just can't tolerate a vaccine development program that's going to take 10 years. We have to do everything we can and throw the kitchen sink at it and everything else. And so what that meant from a government standpoint is it was bringing two very different cultures together. Um, it was the culture of health and human services, which is the NIH and the CDC and all the, the aspects of what health and human service does. And, and all of the scientific and technical expertise that they had. But the beauty was then to bring in the Department of Defense. So Operation Warp Speed was this merger, if you will, this synergy um, between these two different cultures. Um, the, the Department of Defense is really good at moving stuff. And they're really good at planning and executing operations, because that's what we do. And we do that all over the world, you know, 24 7 we have 
carrier groups moving around right now. We have soldiers deployed all throughout the world every day, all day, and we have to do everything we can do to sustain them. That's just it's what we do. Um, we don't usually do that for a public health response, and we've really never done that before for vaccine development. So I had the really unique position to be a bit of the translator between those two cultures. So taking the operational and logistics culture of the Department of Defense and the research and development and technical culture of HHS and bring the two together. And so um, I had fun with it because these people spoke completely different languages <laughs> and, uh, and they didn't understand each other, and uh, which caused a lot of frustration and friction. But I think what came from that was, you know, it's, I guess my point for this group is a little bit about, um, you know, we have a culture in, in medicine and clinical practice and in medical research, and there are clearly other cultures in the private sector and otherwise that you can sometimes bring together. Um, uh, medical ethics is a good example of bringing together philosophy and thought with the, the practicality of clinical practice. But the point is, Sometimes, especially with an emergency and a common mission, you bring two cultures together, and it can be amazing, and it can be synergistic. So it, we couldn't have done it without the expertise of the NIH, but I'm telling you right now, we couldn't have done it without the Department of Defense. Getting in there, planning the rollout, planning every single aspect of the supply chain so that we can scale manufacturing at a scale that had never been done before. I think I told this story last night. You know, Department of Defense came in and we said, look, we're going to have to manufacture 100 million doses of vaccine. And what everybody then does is gravitates to the, okay, let's go to the plant where we're going to actually scale that vaccine in the big bioreactors and all that other stuff. And the Department of Defense says, that's, that's not the important part. The important part is the supply chain of every single aspect that you need to have secured, the equipment, the supplies, that need to show up and need to all be at the same right place at the right time for you to do your first manufacturing run. All getting all of that together was really the big bottleneck. The equipment takes 12 weeks, the raw materials, the cholesterol to make the RNA vaccine, we have to get from overseas and it's shut down. All of those logistics of supply chain, um, we were able to solve. We were able to solve in record time. And so um, it's a really good lesson in terms of bringing those two groups together. The other lesson, and, and then I want to go, I want to move on to the future, is that um, what was so fun is that it was really so disruptive to the product development process. Um, typically, I think, you know, this, this audience knows well sort of this pattern of if we want to make a vaccine or a therapeutic and we have to start off with our basic research and our preclinical testing, we do our small-scale manufacturing, we do our early safety clinical trials, we do more manufacturing, we do our later clinical trials, we do more manufacturing, we apply to the FDA for approval, and we get approved. What we did was we said, we don't have time, run them, all of these things in parallel. And so, and what that meant was, uh, and I think, uh, I don't know if this was always as clear to the public as, as maybe we should have been, but what it meant is, is that there was never compromise on safety or efficacy in terms of what would be done. In other words, we didn't do one less trial, or we didn't do half the number of safety subjects that you would normally do. We took no risk in terms of safety and efficacy. Where we did take a lot of risk was financial, because what we said was, we're gonna start large-scale manufacturing at the beginning, early, after phase one clinical trials. Pharmaceutical companies would never do that because they said, well, we may drop $50 million on a manufacturing run of, and those doses of vaccine may never go into shot in arms. We said 50 million versus the trillions of dollars of impact on the U.S. economy. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no question that we should take those types of risks, financial risks, and do all of these processes in parallel. Um, our phase three clinical trials were 30,000 volunteer placebo controlled trials. Two year follow up, enormously expensive. Hundreds and hundreds of clinical sites throughout the United States. Uh, Janssen, as an example, had sites at least 15 or 20 different countries. They, they, their their FIBL phase three was 44,000 volunteers. You don't do that normally. You, you do smaller trials in phase twos and you de risk and you sort of work through a logical projection because of cost. Um, 
but we moved it all up and we did a lot of things at risk. But what we found though is if you think about if you think about the trade-off, so our normal progression really is is that because we don't have that money and we don't want to take the financial risk. But what is the opportunity cost of taking 10 years to develop a vaccine or to develop a treatment for Alzheimer's or to, you know, of, of all of the other or, you know, a next generation immunotherapy for cancer. The, the point is, is that uh, the phar a pharmaceutical company developing drug isn't going to take that individual financial risk. But the financial cost of us perpetuating a lack of treatment or a lack of vaccine is much more massive than the financial risk of having three companies start manufacturing at scale earlier in their process. So as a society, that's how we should do all our products, frankly. We should figure out, and, and if that's public sector funding or different kinds of incentives, there's so much more that we can do. Um, and what I hope we achieve at the end of the Operation Warp Speed and the COVID experience, as we say, you know, as a society, you know, we're just not going to tolerate it takes 10 years or 12 years to develop a vaccine. It's not acceptable. Or, it, you know, it's going to take, it's going to really take 10 to 15 years to see the benefits of immunotherapy translate into, um, you know, true population benefit in terms of metastatic cancer. Not acceptable, you know? And so um, that's what I'm talking about in terms of, uh, you know, I, I would love to see us just blow up the current system, if you will, and sort of it, it embrace this, uh, this new way to do, um, to do product development. And I think where, where a medical center like yourself really comes into this um, is that I think the, one of the things we did really well but we have to do even better is these large-scale clinical trials at speed. And I think uh, this center, as well as many others, uh, this idea of here's the protocol, you have the apparatus, you can implement in real time, you have the energy, cost is not an issue, so we're going to have the money available, um, but you're going to execute that clinical trial. Um, we talk about concepts like virtual clinical trials, we talk about opt-in enrollment, always maintaining, uh, respecting volunteers, and always maintaining the highest of ethical standards, but enrolling a lot of people in a really short period of time. Millions of people in clinical trials, I think, is the way that we can accelerate all product developments, so all needs rise then, as that tide rises in terms of doing clinical trials very differently. So that's the past. <laughs> and uh, um, talk too much. What I wanted to uh, let me let me do some of the future thoughts here, and and I'm going to show you a couple slides, and then um, take a couple questions uh, as we go. Well, let me pause there. Is there any questions, thoughts, comments from the audience? Anyone want to ask me a question before we move on to the future? Yeah, please. So I guess has this process about creating a vaccine for global use? Is there a better process that we could use instead of having approval in the United States versus approval in the EU versus approval in Russia and, and every continent and country? Yes. Is there a better way to do that? Oh yes. <laughs> it's hard to do, but 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 absolutely. I think, but which and, and we're going to talk about the global mission, um, and, I'll, and I'll show you some slides and thoughts. Um, but the uh, I think your question is so if if. if Broadly, strategically, there is a much better process than we currently have, not only to vaccinate America, if you will, in scale manufacturing, but really scale manufacturing to vaccinate the globe against COVID, and ideally then against other infectious diseases too. Um, so there's a lot that we can do in that global process. Your question was getting a little bit more towards the regulatory mess, which is how we approve um, how how regulatory is approved? How regulatory approval is achieved for global vaccines? And the simple answer is it's a mess. And the simple answer is is that it's it's this struggle with autonomy in terms of each country wants to be able to do their own thing, and to an extent that should be you know respected and understood. Um, but the flip side is is that uh, if to get a vaccine to a given country and you need regulatory approval and that costs two months per country and massive resources every single country every single time you do that for every single vaccine 
there's enormous waste in the system. And during uh, a once in a century pandemic, we don't have time for that waste. So the, the best things that we've seen is that on an international organization level, at the, at the level of the World Health Organization, that they've said, you know, we are going to sort of harmonize how we do regulatory approval. And they do have method, they do have mechanisms where they say, we will give a WHO stamp of approval for the vaccine. And then is that stamp of approval good enough? If it is, then the vaccines can flow very quickly um, to those countries. The role of the Food and Drug Administration is actually really important in this, but it's also important to define. The Food and Drug Administration doesn't license vaccines for any other country other than the United States. It has a domestic mission. It should have a domestic mission. You know, it shouldn't be telling other countries what to do. It does have a high standard, and in that global standard, other countries will say, well, if the FDA approves it, it's probably good enough for me. And then that, that does accelerate. The, the problem is, is that uh, it, it's not as simple as the FDA has a really high standard, so we should run all our vaccines through the FDA, and therefore, then we can send them anywhere in the world. That process doesn't work because the FDA doesn't have an incentive to approve global vaccines. It's not their mission. And especially what the FDA has done during this pandemic, and they've been heroes, is that they've had this whole process called emergency use authorization, which is, if you will, an interim but close step to full licensure. But it's a total acknowledgement that they're doing this because of an emergency. Um, and it's, it's still a very high standard, but it's also taking into account risk benefit in terms of needing, um, needing product right now, okay? Um, the problem is, now, is are we still in an emergency in terms of vaccine use? Because the good news, you know, daily case counts are going down, hospitalizations are under 40,000 Americans in the hospital right now. All we're seeing a lot of really good metrics. But what we're seeing is we've got a free vaccine and we have more vaccines than people want right now. So there, there's not an emergency to approve more vaccines. So we're kind of caught in this weird scenario of if the FDA doesn't want to do emergency use, they may not approve more vaccines. Not because they're bad vaccines, just because we don't need them. Um, but then the rest of the world is going to say, well, if it's not approved by the FDA, it's not good enough for us. And then we're in a mess, which is exactly the point of the question. So, we as a, as, as, as I hope the United States takes a global leadership role in global COVID response, not just vaccination, but all aspects of ending the pandemic and never letting it happen again. Um, we're going to need to do a lot of leadership to work through the complexity of the exact what said. Any other questions for about it? Yeah, yeah um, I found uh, the, I guess the U.S. development of vaccines very interesting, but uh, another interesting thing this whole um, pandemic has been seeing uh, certain other countries using their own vaccine development and kind of using it as a diplomatic maneuver. So, yeah. I actually just kind of wanted to hear your opinion on maybe the big differences between yeah. our development process here in the U.S. against yeah. like Russia's Sputnik vaccine sure. and the sign of pharma. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. So the problem is, then you're going to ask the rest of the lecture. <laughs> so, so, because it's, so, it's so interesting and important and complex, and um, I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> it's yeah. sort of my passion. Because I, you know, I think. It, my bias declared very clearly. I think the United States uh, is not better than anybody else, but we have a tradition of global leadership in public health and global health. We have a lot of capability that can make a huge difference in the world, and I think we should. And I think we should lead um, where we can lead, and lead by example, which is humility, altruism, um, and, and driven by mission to end the pandemic. Um, as such, uh, what that, um, that means a lot in terms of resources and what we do and sort of how we do this. So uh, I'll, I'll start to answer one. Uh, let, me, let me do two quick answers on part of the question. Um, the first is, is that you know, I'm, I'm frankly very proud of the investments. Operation Warp Speed was investments in, in these six vaccines. Um, the investments in those six vaccines did a lot to get those vaccines across the finish line. 
now that they're across the finish line and they have global impact. That investment itself of Ameri you know, American taxpayer dollars um, has already had a huge impact on this pandemic. Yeah. Uh, pushing along Yams and AstraZeneca and these products that are now being globally used and scaled has had a huge impact in and of itself. So I'm glad we did that, and let's not forget that. Um, your, your question, um, not to get all foreign policy wonky about it, but sort of this idea of, if you will, multilateralism versus bilateral. Of relationships, and the answer to your question is, is that that's being hotly debated right now inside our, our United States government and, and in our society. I mean, you see, uh, everybody's got an opinion. You know, I love America. Everybody's got to have their opinion and write it up, and um, and sometimes send it to me. <laughs> but the uh, the the debate hasn't been settled completely. But President Biden came out on Tuesday and said. Originally came out and said we're going to donate some. Now he's come out and said we're going to donate more. Um, but in his comments, he talks a lot about the World Health Organization, and he talks a lot about what's called the Covax facility. Well, it's basically a uh, it's at a multilateral or international level where the World Health Organization and their groups say that we will buy a vaccine and then we will equitably distribute that vaccine, especially to countries that can't afford it. And that multilateral approach um, is favored, and that's what President Biden said in his speech. And so therefore, for us to give resources so that they can buy vaccines, um, but also that as a mechanism uh, for us to donate vaccines that we don't need, and also for us to help them distribute vaccines. Everybody focuses on the doses, and no one focuses on the massive challenge of distribution and administration. So how, how can we help them distribute to the world? Um, is, the, is the assertion in our foreign policy that we are going to be multilateral, we are going to encourage the global community to go to work together. Um, that's in contrast to bilateral relationships where we say we're gonna donate, we're gonna donate vaccine to this country because that's good for them, but that's also good for us and then vaccine gets more transactional. Um, there, there's been policy statements, including by the president, that we're, we're essentially not gonna use vaccine to achieve a foreign policy advantage, to use that in negotiation. That's at least the, the stated policy now. Um, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. It's more complex though, because there may, be, there may be situations where we may say, we're gonna bilaterally send vaccine to country X, because the outbreak is awful there right now, and the best thing we can do for our global public health response is make sure that country gets vaccinated. Um, complex, but you can sort of see, like, is it, what's gonna drive our global response? Should it be driven by what's best for the global public health response? Should it be driven by equity and fairness? And all of these things kind of play into the complexity of it. Um, but there will be, but there could be occasions where bilateral relationships make a lot of sense. Another example is from a, a, from a trade or economic standpoint. So it may, may make sense for us to ensure that we have you know, well-covered vaccinated populations of people that travel to our country the most, or of, of our, our trading partners who would put our economy at risk if they have a massive next wave of an outbreak and it takes down their industry and that critical supply chain is how we make product X, Y. So, um, really good question. That's just the tip of the end. But I'm, I'm glad you asked. And I hope that's, it's not really medical, <laughs> but it's sort of a little bit strategic. Um, how about I do a little bit of future and I'll pause for the next question. Is that good? But if you guys want to talk, just talk. Sorry. Um, so, so I did want to talk a little bit about the global mission. We teased you there a little bit. I want to ask you about immunocompromised patients because I want to see what you think. Um, the duration of protection and new boosters is a hot topic, and I can tell you kind of where we're at. Um, and a little bit on variants at the very end. So one of the things that I think is, I don't, you're, you may not be like me, but I am totally geeking out on the access to information that we have during this pandemic that we have never had before. You know, for us, for me to be able to say, well, case counts yesterday were in the, you know, 28 to 29,000 cases per day nationally, and here are the cases in the states, and here are the cases in the county. We've never been able to do that before. Never for infectious diseases. You know, how many cases of, how many cases of gonorrhea or syphilis do we have? 
uh, what's our, our, our understanding of influenza, of an influenza season, often comes at the end of the season. Like we look back in March or April, we say, oh, that looked like it was a really, really bad season. I mean, we have real-time access to very detailed information on how this pandemic is going. That's awesome. That's an un that's like, think about then if we could pivot that to other health problems. Think about the value of real-time information as we make big policy decisions that aren't made on anecdote or, well, this is my impression, or this is, this is what I think our hospital should do. This is what I think is going on in our community because I talked to three people. I mean, this idea of data driving decisions in health and healthcare, like, now's the time. So the next, next few slides, it's all Google, basically. And, and it's not me, I have someone on the team because I don't know how to use it, right, of course, but uh, I'm the older generation, but you know, get the 20 year olds and the 25 year olds and they'll click, click, click and put these things together. So um, starting with the good news is that case started out, I think everybody's familiar with this. I, I, I'm excited about the, the hot. So we talk about a lot of different metrics. I think the number of Americans hospitalized is a very useful metric. All of these things you take with a grain of salt because patient comes in with a myocardial infarction and you swab their nose and they have you know, COVID in the nose for one day. And is that a COVID hospitalization or is that an MI hospitalization? Hard to, you know, but, but with that in mind, we're pretty much at our, uh, we're, we're at least approaching, we're pretty much at our all time level. Extraordinary. And you know, why? Maybe summer, maybe some other things, maybe a little bit of, a lot of people now have, of course, a natural infection, but um, it's vaccine. It's vaccine. And we, you know, you look at other countries as well, the impact of vaccine has been profound. Um, the other thing that I think is really cool on Google is they have this mobility index, and you can click on different things like, you know, retail and public transportation and all these things. But it's, it's a really interesting metric to track because basically it's what we sense. Like, whether or not you agree with the with public health guidelines, we're kind of functioning like we're mostly back to normal. You know, when I flew here, and we're walking through Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., the place is packed. And, and we all know this, right? We're, we're back to normal. So I find it extraordinary that we're almost back to normal and that our cases are going down. So really good news. Um, not so good news. So I think everybody everybody's aware sort of of the, of the information that we're seeing coming out of India. Um, all the information that we're talking about on these slides is, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's subject to bias and tricks and things like that in terms of how public health surveillance information is measured. So um, your scientific mind should kick in and be a little bit critical and say, well, how do we know that? And how do they measure? And you know, what's really going on in, in India? And I don't know those answers. Um, I'll tell you kind of what I think. I think, I think what happened in India, and when we, when we saw that first wave, which you can see that early peak there, is I think, I think they had a massive wave of infection. Truly, truly massive wave of infection. And they didn't, like us, they didn't have the, the PCR testing and all of that in place um, to be able to uh, categorize or to really understand the, the magnitude of that massive wave. Why do I say that? Because you can look at actually their seroprevalence studies, and I mean, they had you know after that wave, you had seroprevalence studies of twenty percent, thirty percent, fifty percent in given communities, and that's a lot. And remember, when we do seroprevalence for this infection, remember that after that first course of natural infection, you don't have lifelong antibodies. You may not even have antibodies for three to six months. So, so the seroprevalence, the antibodies you measure, is a subset of the overall infection in that community as well. So seroprevalence in India, really, really high. So in my mind, that's a, that they probably had enough natural infection to be able to kind of keep things under control um, until the current outbreak. And no one knows exactly what, what happened here. Um, was it a variant? Because we have, you know, again, multiple variants circulating in India. Um, I kind of think that there's a bit of a waning natural infection um, impact here. In other words, we know more, more at least suspicion, but we're, the data is accumulating that natural infection doesn't protect you forever. And that natural infection may not do all that great in protecting you from variant infection, especially some of these more kind of resistant type variants. And so I think we had a combination of waning immunity, um, 
clearly festivals and a lot of public gatherings, um, and no criticism because we do that too, you know, that's what people do, um, but it led to this massive spike. And then there's also the other, I think, infectious diseases all of us off. It's, it's like, why do outbreaks happen? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But what I do know is, is that for truly contagious outbreaks, once they take off in the spark and all those conditions are ripe, it goes exponentially. You know, and we saw that in here many times, in, you know, locally and even nationally, and I think that's what's happening now. So I looked at these data recently and I said, hey, look, it's peaking and it's coming down again. And then I read all these news reports that essentially they're running into lots of issues in terms of testing. And so uh, my conclusion here is, is that, um, you know, there, India is certainly not out of the woods. And, um, you know, death is a very hard measure. You know, you guys know this. When you, when you write cause of death, do you write COVID or do you write myocardial infarction or both? Um, but, uh, but deaths are horrible. Uh, deaths are horrible there now. Cases are terrible there now. I mean, we have a, we have a humanitarian obligation to everything there. Um, so I wanted to also show, show you Seychelles, because um, I wanted to see if I could say it right. <laughs> but also, because um, it's super interesting. Um, and it's to your question a little bit about other vaccines, which I kind of didn't go into details. Um, the, so well, Seychelles is the, quote, oh, it's the most vaccinated country in the world, and you can sort of see the numbers. And, and even early on in the process, you know, very early on when vaccines were starting to roll out, they had more than 50% of their population vaccinated. Um, however, it was vaccinated with Sinopharm, uh, which is 99% sure is that it, the World Health Organization has actually approved Sinopharm um, and had a little bit of AstraZeneca as well. Um, and what I'm showing you here is, again, there is now an outbreak in the Seychelles uh, with a vaccinated population. So there's one absolutely crucial question that I cannot answer for you. Um, but it should be the very first thing you come to mind whenever we talk about it. And that is, okay, uh, what is the clinical status of those cases? Because what we know and what we've been thrilled about, someone asked me last night, when, when did you know, when were you thrilled? And it was like when we first saw like the Pfizer and Moderna data uh, for their phase three efficacy trial. And they, you know, again, high efficacy. But what the best part about it was hospitalizations and deaths, right? It was the high level of protection against hospitalizations and deaths. And what's been great to see play out is not just the RNA vaccines, but also with AstraZeneca, and also with the Janssen products, that even though they may have lower efficacy in terms of symptomatic infection, that their efficacy against hospitalization and death is still very, very high seems to be true with just about all of the vaccines that we've been working on. And you know, that's great news. It's, that's ultimately what we're trying to accomplish, right? Um, and you know, not only is that keeping people out of the hospital and keeping people from dying from COVID, but you know better than I do that you know, when COVID is overwhelming your hospital, it's so hard just to do the routine care for all the other stuff. And you know, it's so hard for you know, if people don't come into the hospital. So we have this, we have this impact on the healthcare system when the healthcare system is overwhelmed. And so the prevention of hospitalization and death is what we're trying to achieve. So the super interesting question is, does the sign? We know the Sinopharm vaccine has a lower efficacy. We know AstraZeneca uh, better than Sinopharm, but a, lot, a lower efficacy than the RNAs. But the question in the Seychelles, which I can't answer is are those people sick or are they asymptomatic infection? Because you can, you can see scenarios where if you swab everybody and you have a little bit of RNA in your nose, you're gonna have pretty high caseload. Um, that's not what's important, right? What's really important is the hospitalizations and deaths. So what we are doing is looking out at all of these examples in these different countries as they roll out all these different vaccines, looking at real world effectiveness, looking at, um, how well, how much protection um, do we have? And the other thing, which I'm not going to talk about too much, but I think it's super interesting, is this idea of mixing and matching vaccines. So the, in other words, you get your first dose of Sinopharm, or you get two doses of Sinopharm, or you get one dose of AstraZeneca, like the United Kingdom did. The United Kingdom rolled out a lot of AstraZeneca vaccine, but said, we're not going to do zero in four weeks, we're going to do zero, 
until we get one dose in as many people as possible, and then we're going to have 12 to 13 weeks for your second dose. And we're going to, in that meantime, try to do some studies to see if that second dose is Pfizer or if that second dose is a different type of vaccine, a protein vaccine maybe, like Novavax. Um, does that give you a better immune response than if you got two doses of AstraZeneca? So the jury's still out on that one. Um, but there have been some interesting reports now um, that are saying, you know, start with another vaccine, but if you get a boost with, or you get your second dose or your third dose, whatever combination, um, with an RNA, for example, you get a really nice immune response measured by neutralizing antibodies. So, um, and frankly, it's just gonna make it a heck of a lot easier from a global distribution. If we don't have to, you don't have to get your second dose or your third dose of the same thing. Like, you get what we got, and you know, you'll get that second or third dose um, to follow these things up. So um, these were my final two points, and then I'll pause kind of my global response. Um, I, I like to quote 10 to 14 billion doses, because um, it sounds impossible, <laughs> first of all. So I, I think there's a bit of a shock value, and then there's a bit of a why not value. Um, uh, but that's about the give or take of two thirds of the world population. So um, you can ask, well, herd immunity, is that two thirds? I'm going to say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what herd immunity is, um, but I do know we seem to be doing really well in the United States and not at that two thirds yet. And other countries where we've seen really um, good response to the vaccine, um, it's not like they have to get to two thirds or three quarters before we see that, that really, really nice response. Um, but the point is, um, clearly the pandemic doesn't go away until we get to 10 to 14 billion doses. Um, and for another time, we can talk about sort of how, uh, how we get there. Um, but I, I will make the point that I, um, yeah, I'm kind of a broken record on this, but I'll uh, leave you with, if we can make 14 million doses of COVID vaccine, we can make 14, we can make a billion doses of your top 10, uh, you know, you know vaccine-preventable diseases, and we can wipe them all out. You know? Coronavirus, hepatitis B, HPV, like all these scourges. And for anyone that then wants to give me a hard time and say, wow, that's like, you're gonna spend, you're gonna make a billion doses and it's ten dollars a dose and that's ten billion dollars. And when you do the when you do the uh, the the health economics calculation, maybe in question, I hope someone can quite uh, question me if it's not true, or else I'm just gonna keep saying it. Um, but when you do the health economic calculation, the best investment you can make is vaccine. Because what you're doing is you're giving something and you're totally taking all of the cost of that disease for as long as you protect completely off the table. And when you think about that, especially for a contagious disease, think sexually transmitted infections, influenza, HIV, you not only prevent that disease in that person, you prevent the spread. So more money for vaccines. <laughs> but, but, but gosh, just think about it though. Unique time in history in terms of what we're thinking. Um, one or two global questions, and then I'll do. I want to get to me on suppression because I want to hear what you think. Any other global comments, thoughts? Yes. Kind of an off question. To the glucose emergency authorization in India, how is that going to complicate the vaccine story? Yeah, I have a couple answers, and it's, um, but it's really complex. <laughs> Um, so, so broadly speaking, the, the, the situation in India is horrific and tragic, and we need to do everything we can. I think um, one of the impacts that we're seeing on the situation in India is that India is, uh, as far as I understand, really the largest manufacturer of vaccines globally. And so the world has been counting on those vaccines as part of the global response. In India, I think we all understand why, India said, Vaccines made in India are going to address this wave going on right now as our first priority. I, I think we can respect that. Um, but uh, the, the, the concept that, uh, well, as long as we're protected in America, it doesn't really matter. It's also at every level. But I highlight that. that I think people understand that the, the, in, the impact in India, not only just with this, the virus spreading and the, the horrible tragedy that it is, has a profound impact on our global vaccination campaign. 
Um, I think the second part to your question is this idea of approved therapies. It's actually back to your question as well. Um, it's, it's really complex. This is, this is not, this is something where thoughtful medical professionals need to really dig in because um, what is the burden of proof in terms of a product being safe and effective? And, you know, there is, there's two sides to this argument. And the answer is it really depends case by case. And uh, my only thing is, whichever way you decide, decide quickly. So what I mean by that is, don't submit to regulatory approval and take six months. So it's a hard decision, but make that hard decision. So the, the trade-off is emergency use of potentially a very promising therapeutic product, but it hasn't really been tested very well. And the scary part of the having been tested is not only just does it work or not, or it, is it safe or not? But also, can you manufacture it consistently every single time reproducibly? Does that make sense? Like, I think we have, we're clinicians, right? We, we forget that part of it, but it takes time to show I can make that product 10 times in a row and it meets that specification all 10 times. Because otherwise, we're then taking risks there in terms of the quality of that product. So you have to have that. You have to have the safety and efficacy as best as we can understand. And so there is a lot we've seen in the therapeutic space. There has been a lot of shots on goal of different things that we thought were helpful or not. And probably invite me back next month and we'll talk therapeutics the whole time because I think it's really, really interesting in terms of host response modulation and versus kill the virus, but if the horse is out of the barn, it doesn't really matter. I'm talking to clinicians, you know this, but um, septic shock, right? So, uh, to really address the treatment of infectious diseases, we have to get much better at modulating the host response in addition to killing the virus. Um, but you know, that's been a big mixed bag this pandemic, as you know. Um, so, so I don't know the right answer of how you know. Do we because it's an emergency? Do we have you know less safety, less efficacy? But we've got to get this life-saving product out there versus maintaining a high standard to ensure that these products are safe and effective. Um, but what I will say is this, is that the, the best way to figure it out, in addition to rapid regulatory decision, is the clinical trials. So it goes back to the point I was making before of, this is why we need clinical trials in networks super fast. Okay? Can I make one other point to that? Absolutely. The other danger of emergency use for quasi-effective therapies do we take our eye off the ball from developing really effective therapies? Yes. That was actually, you know, it's, it's interesting. For, so yes, very insightful, Chris. It's very interesting. One of the concerns early on in our vaccine program is they were like, what if the first one or two vaccines out of the gate is 50% effective at preventing severe disease and 30% effective at, at symptomatic infection? So not very good, but better than nothing. Um, if you put all your eggs in the not very good but better than nothing basket, you may prohibit a better. In other words, emergency use, and then that's what we're scaling. Um, we were we were lucky. We were lucky that the first few products rolling out were very highly effective. Um, it's a it's a it's a significant consideration. It's a um, it's a distraction issue too, isn't it? You know, and I think you guys tell me. I mean, the my sense in the therapeutic landscape has also been. We sort of had, okay, well, you have 10 different choices now. We had Desivere, and then we had some of the monoclonals, but then it's like, well, now you can enroll a clinical trial of 10 different, there's 10 different things out there. Um, well, you're never going to get a clinical trial done. It, you know, if, if you need 1,000 patients divided by one, you're going to enroll all 1,000. You divide by 10, that's only 100 per trial, then you complete the trials. Um, yeah, we just have to do better. I'm a big fan of real world effectiveness, though, too. I, you know, placebo controlled trials is going to be, that's our bread and butter. We understand why that's the traditional way of doing things. I think on vaccine, these real world effectiveness studies, um, you guys probably don't geek out on it, but on a daily basis, we're seeing all these real world effectiveness studies rolling out of Israel and these different places. It's really useful. It is super, super useful. Uh, looking at how, you know, 10,000 healthcare workers and following them are 50,000 healthcare workers and when are they getting sick and then when are they getting sick with what are those breakthrough cases like? Super informative. So, just something to think about. Um, 
Let's, let's move on a little bit. I do want to get to, this is just one study, and, and, I, and, I, and I put this up there because I was like, well, if it's great house, i got to show a little bit of data. But the, uh, this is just, it, it, it's, it's showing you some charts with a basic point that you already know. And what you already know is that no matter how good the vaccine is, if we give it to patients who their immune system is abnormal, um, they're going to not respond nearly as strongly. And so this was one of the one of the many articles that are out there. Um, it shouldn't supply, surprise you that if we deplete your B cells, your uh, response to the vaccine is going to be terrible. Um, but even in glucocorticoids, now of course all steroids are not the same, and I understand that for this medical audience. But the point is, we give steroids to a lot of people, and sometimes we give them in bursts, and sometimes we give them for six months, and sometimes we give them for a very long period of time. If you think about the American population, I was asked this question actually: What percent of the American health population is immunosuppressed? Well, that question doesn't really make sense because it depends on how you define immunosuppression. But if we're thinking about people that are getting steroids and autoimmune diseases, and diabetes, and throwing them in, there's there's obviously a lot of gradation there. But that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And from a public health standpoint, it's always been get the vaccine out there first. But our community, our clinical and our public health community, really now need to think about this. How are we going to how are we going to protect these populations? Now, one of the things I'm excited about is um, back to what I was telling you at the beginning with monoclonal antibodies and things like that. I think I think we can get into prophylactic antibodies, especially longer lasting antibodies, to sort of bridge us through solid organ transplant or to bridge us through a course of steroids, especially in high risk patients. Um, one of the exciting things in the monoclonal antibody front, I think everybody's tracking that the approved products right now are administered by IV infusion. Um, I think there's been lots of press on why that's so complex and difficult to do in an emergency response to the pandemic. Um, the AstraZeneca product, uh, the AstraZeneca monoclonal product is actually IM injection. And there's, so there's that and there's other formulations that are coming around in IM. Um, that product is not read out in clinical trials yet, um, but it's kind of a good one to keep your eye on. So uh, get your shot, six months of protection, but there may be a lot of scenarios where that could uh, protect uh, either in a post-exposure or in a pre-exposure but high-risk exposure type of scenario. So it also gives us, for some of these next-generation monocles, it gives us some hope for uh, variants. I'm going to make a quick variant comment at the end. Again, I, I put this in there because um, we followed along. I wanted to, because it was sort of a prompt to tell me tell you the long-term care facility story. Um, the, uh, because I think it's one of the best things we did um, in terms of our national vaccine rollout. Um, very early in the process, with limited doses, we said, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to be extremely proactive in vaccinating long-term care facilities. And uh, everybody knows why. Um, clearly a vulnerable population. We, we all watched the sort of these, uh, geez, horrific statistics, uh, the number of deaths coming out of these different facilities. I don't know if you had a, a sort of a community experience with that or not, um, but the, um, we vaccinated those populations and the number of cases and deaths in long-term care facilities like plummeted. It is like January, February, they just plummeted and they stayed extremely well. Um, very encouraging. What I wanted to do, though, this, this was one report um, that came out of Kentucky. This came out the same week there was a similar report out of Chicago. And it was kind of, there was a, there was a little bit of glass half full in terms of, it was a vaccinated population. It was an outbreak introduced by a healthcare worker. It looked like it was variant uh, that was contributing to the outbreak. Um, but that the, you know, the vaccine still held up even against, even in a long-term care facility population, you know, acknowledging that population is going to be, you know, hard to protect because they have, you know, they're immunosuppressed as well. So good protection against symptomatic illness. Um, but you know, it just kind of illustrated this fundamental point of this was introduced by healthcare workers, and that healthcare, the healthcare worker vaccination rates, I think, among long-term care facilities. Uh, all commerce staff working in there 
it's like in the neighborhood of like 55%. If anyone knows these data better than I do, please tell me. Think about that. And you know, that was healthcare workers were really at the front of the front of the line. Remember the long-term care facility, the, the whole rollout was the patients and the staff. So that was that was January, and you know, we're at 55 percent. Like we got a problem. I don't I don't know how to fix that one. But I think the reason I kind of wanted to present this a little bit soapboxy, and I'm sorry, but it's like um, we got to constantly keep up this. You know, you need to be vaccinated. And I think if if you're a healthcare worker, you say, well, I'm not worried, or I'm not worried about me. It's like I don't know how you can be a healthcare worker in a long-term care facility um, and not get vaccinated. If you say, well, the long-term, all the all the patients are vaccinated, so I don't need to be. This is concrete evidence that that's not the case. Uh, so I just wanted to flash this real quick because it reminded me. It reminds me to talk about these variants. Um, I don't know what variants mean. I think it is a couple quick points. The first is again the extraordinary opportunity for us to sequence hundreds of thousands of samples domestically and worldwide uh, has never been done before. Um, never been done before in real time. Um, but we do have a bit of a problem now in terms of too much information. So too much is not too much. But now, I mean, we've got tons of different variants that are popping up in different places and different mutations and combinations. I hear about a new one every day. And I don't know what they all mean. Um, I do remind us all in terms of viral evolution that viruses do evolve, yes. Viruses can evolve to be more deadly. Viruses can be evolved to evade the immune response. Um, viruses can also evolve to be more contagious, but less harmful. And so, and there is a constant competition between viruses that we see this with flu every year. We have bad strains of flu, we have good strains of flu. Sometimes the less severe flu strains outcompete the more severe ones. Uh, so it's super complex. And basically, if you ask me what we should do about variants, I don't know the answer to that. But what I will say is this: that I do think, and I'm going to contradict myself with this with the, these data. But what I do think is that. What we are seeing now as we do six month boosters for some of the vaccines in our portfolio with Moderna as an example, and they recently published this, is that when they get their third dose at six months, their neutralizing antibodies skyrocket. Okay, well, immunology 101, you boost, you prime, you boost. We're seeing a really good booster response to neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies against the original coronavirus, but also against the 351 South Africa variant. So, the neutralizing antibodies against the variant after that booster skyrocket. Why is that good news? That's really good news when we think about should we boost? And if we do boost, should we boost with a, uh, a tailored vaccine against the variant? Or can we get away with giving the original once again? That's a hotly debated topic right now in my world. Um, we do not have official policy on it. I'll be a tiny bit careful. Um, but if we can boost with the, if you get your third dose with that original vaccine and you're protected not only against the original coronavirus, but against whatever variant that the viral evolution is taking us, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier than if we have to chase all these resistant variants with new vaccines and new strains and bivalent and quadrivalent vaccines like we have to do every year with the forms. So I hope that's where it goes. So all that sounded great, but I wanted to present data that's the opposite. So the bad news is that if you, all I want you to do is see patient one over there, and patient one is a vaccinated patient with a symptomatic infection with a variant who had really high neutralizing antibodies. <laughs> um, well, uh, and and uh, with that, so, we're in, a, we're in a massive scientific debate right now to understand if neutralizing antibodies it's truly correlates with protection. I think for those, anyone who knows anything about vaccines, correlates of protection is gold. If I can measure, if I can give you a shot, I can measure a response and I can say if you're above a threshold, you're protected and you're below, you're not. It guides our entire product development and vaccine policy. We don't have a correlate of protection right now. Um, 
I'm hoping neutralizing antibodies is a correlative protection. I'm showing you one patient that had high neutralizing antibodies and just got infected. So then that means maybe this is not a perfect correlative protection. But I will, my sense is, is that this is an outlier and that neutralizing antibodies do correlate. So therefore, if we boost, and you get very high neutralizing antibodies, we think you're going to be protected both against original virus and against variants. Um, and so we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, final part uh, is, so what are we going to do with boosters? Um, and again, we haven't officially come out and said what we're doing. The United Kingdom has officially come out and said we're boosting in the fall. Uh, they're boosting their highest populations. Um, I think my sense is uh, two, two facts. The first is, completely obvious that if protection wanes over time, and the only way we really, really know that is we see a ton of breakthrough cases. If we wait through the breakthrough cases in the highest risk populations, it's too late, right? You can't, you can't just, you can't have the outbreak start, go into exponential growth, then start a booster campaign. You're going to have to be way ahead of that. Second fact is, is that we know the patients that are most vulnerable to hospitalization and death from COVID are the elderly, comorbid, immunosuppressed, long-term care facilities. So those are the same types of patients that probably will not have a durable response, right? But they're going to be the first ones where, that are going to have waning immunity, and they're the most vulnerable. So I'm tipping my hand a little bit in terms of what I think we should do for, for, um, for what we're calling our third dose of vaccine. Um, but I think... Um, I think most of us are at least probably in a mental construct that we're going to need, we're not, we're not done, for, you're not going to get lifelong protection from your coronavirus vaccine so far. Can you share your thoughts on the, ne the next pandemic risk? What is it, when, and what are we doing to try to model it? That's a quick question. The quick answer is, it, uh, we're going to have future pandemics, we're going to have more of them. We have global, you know, but before this one, we were like, globalization is just uh, putting us exquisitely vulnerable for uh, the, the international spread of, of disease. Um, and we had, if you will, near misses in terms of um, certainly H1N1 pandemic in 2009, uh, before that SARS, uh, uh, Zika, chikungunya in the Western Hemisphere, Ebola, um, Worst of all outbreak in history, you know, exponentially worse than any other that we had seen. Um, fortunately, did not spread to the United States and a lot of other countries out of Sub-Saharan Africa. But we were terrified that you know that was going to spread to Lagos, Nigeria, and then boom, major urban population. We used to say, sorry to digress. We used to say Ebola is horrific, but it's never going to spread to urban areas because most patients are symptomatic and they get really sick. And so it's just not conducive to spread to major urban areas until it did. Um, and so, you know, how are we not going to have more of those? You know, we're going to have more of them. Um, what do I think that, so super interesting question, but uh, uh, let, me, let me give you two things. The first is, so what happens with COVID? And um, I, I'm so tired of this pandemic that I'm going to be Pollyanna, and I'm going to say, I think with the current version of COVID, um, I think we are going to be able to vaccinate the world and, and at least suppress it so that we never have spikes that we've seen like in the United States or India or anywhere else. So I think we will suppress COVID. What I also hope is, is that, like I said, it may be your third or your fourth or your fifth uh, COVID shot, but that gives you an immune education where I don't care what variant it is. Like your, your immune memory is so strong and the virus cannot evolve to evade that very robust immune response so that we're truly protected. Now that may mean a yearly COVID shot for two or three years, um, but I will be Pollyanna and say we're going to get ahead of this version of COVID. Um, coronavirus can give us a COVID-23 or a COVID-25, like coronavirus, you know, does this. We didn't think it would do this, but, but it does this. Um, but we got to get back to flu because, you know, before this, the number one thing was pandemic influenza. And H1N1, the H1N1 pandemic was terrible. Um, wasn't as, didn't have as much severe infection as we were 
you spend your money. Um, certainly, it was terrible with kids. Um, but we sort of said H1N1 was bad, but it was a bit of a near miss, if you will. Um, but we said we're going to have another. We're going to have another flu pandemic. And you know, flu has these really bad years every 10 to 15 years, pandemic-like things. And then uh, every few years, we get like an H3N2 that devastates elderly and stuff. So, um, I, you know, once we're done with COVID, we're going to be working on flu, but then we got to work on everything else too. Now, how do we work on it? So, uh, before COVID, we were getting all wrapped up about universal influenza vaccine. The idea of targeting conserved areas, no matter where the virus mutates. Um, which theoretically sounded awesome, but if it were easy, we would have had, we would have had it, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's actually, um, there's too much mutation in the flu virus to just say, oh, we're just going to do a universal flu vaccine. Um, but there is a lot of promising early products, phase one and all that. So if we can <laughs> end COVID, um, universal flu vaccine will be a top priority. Um, but it's also what we were talking about at the beginning where I've been spending a lot of time in my career is this idea of, I don't care what it is, uh, just give us the sequence. And then if we can have antibodies in 60 days, we can have vaccines rolling out of clinical trials in 90 days, we can scale. We were, always, we were always hoping that if we could do that so fast, you could get ahead of the outbreak and you have antibodies and treatments in the city, the country, where it is, so you fire break, so it never spreads. Um, then you don't need a billion doses, you need 10 million doses. Um, well, that didn't work. So now we're like, so we gotta do that fire break fast, so a million doses or 10 million doses or 100,000 courses of treatment. Um, but now we gotta be like, okay, how do we get to a billion doses in six months or something? You know, half the time we did those from. So can I uh, ask a question, and th this is really one, mostly directed for our students. You know, in medical education, a, a great part of our focus is teaching the student to take care of the one patient in front of them, right? That we talk about the doctor-patient relationship. And clearly you've done that as an infectious disease specialist, taking care of the patient in front of you. And yet you've also kind of pivoted your career and will be concerned more about public health or a global health perspective. Yeah. So can, can you give us some advice for our students, our learners about um, you know, how you can make impact on scale, right? Moving yeah. from the, the, the patient in front of me to the patient across sure. the globe. Sure. Yeah, it's, um, it's really a fun question <laughs> <laughs> to ask. I sort of, um, you know, coming for commencement and graduation, um, this question of career, I would say to start with, um, there is, I looked back, you know, I have some patients right now, and I do all this other stuff, um, but, but the, the experience, the individual patient care experience is, is just a unique privilege in terms of a, a fundamental education process. And, you know, it, it gives, those of us that have had that, just the unique perspective that you can't watch it in a movie or read it in a book. Uh, and, and, and the more patients you take care of and the more that experience is developed, the more valuable that is as a lifelong skill, no matter what you do. Um, so uh, so it's, it's, it's great. I think your, your question is super interesting, though, to say for people that have that skill and then are trained, um, how do they then, can they progress into uh, career paths where they have that type of impact? And I wouldn't exclude it to pharmaceutical product development or global health or national security where I've been. Um, you know, it's, it's what you do in terms of medical education. It's, it's patient administration, it's the economics of healthcare, it's how do we reshape a health system, you know, and people who have been there holding patients' hands are, um, can provide, that you don't have to have that to make a better healthcare system, but it certainly helps people that can understand, can understand the individual experience, but can also think about how we, we have a health system better. Um, I think though, I mean, that's what I love about infectious diseases, is that, um, and I think Michael would attest to this too, in the, in the military we had this crazy unique privilege of 
um, because we have a worldwide deployed force, military medicine has also said, we're going to have to take care of people anywhere and they're going to get sick with malaria and tropical diseases and things. So therefore, our physicians need to be educated in that. So it gave us a chance to be global health um, uh, as part of what we did. That's what I love about infectious diseases. But it was very interesting because I was asked about, um, uh, from medical students, and about sort of, okay, global health, you want to have a global impact on health. So that's infectious diseases. And uh, maybe when, when Michael and I were training, it was, yeah, because of the, you know, the malaria, the TB, and the HIVs of the world had such an impact on the health of the world. And that's not true anymore. Um, they do. But, but global health is road traffic accidents. Global health is diabetes. Global health is affordable cancer treatment. Um, you know, people people are dying in Sub-Saharan Africa. And kids are dying of diarrheal illness and malaria, but they're dying of cervical cancer because they didn't get a, they don't have an HPV vaccine, or they're dying of breast cancer because they have no access to breast cancer treatments, chemotherapy, or anything else. So, I think the the interesting challenge, the fun part about being a medical student today is is that if you want to have a population health impact, there's so much you can do, but it's I love my specialty, so I tell them to go to infectious diseases first. <laughs> but, but the true transformation of global health is all aspects of medicine now. Thank you.